that we start at eight, but that you want to have that, Or can do you want to start with the lecture now? You can do the RT without the bell. Yes. We, can, we can continue. Okay. No problem. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So I need to find a verse. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Shtapitam Yena Bhutale Shayam Rupa Gudamayam Dharati Shapadantikam Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithyananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Om Nam Nam Krishna Krishna Hare 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 So we're just picking the verse, so don't go anywhere. Try this verse. It'll be a surprise to all of us. This is um, this is the second uh, canto, first chapter, text eighteen. So I'll read the Sanskrit. <coughs> param param Vaishnavam amanati tad yaneti netyatad utsis. Utsasrikshavaha Visrija dhoratyam ananya sorida Rida pagyu yarha padam pare pare. You know Sanskrit? No? Okay, well, you're going to learn Sanskrit now. We'll repeat the word meanings. Param. The supreme, padam, situation, Vaishnavam, in relation with the personality of Godhead, amananti, do they know, <coughs> tat, that, yat, which. Na iti, not this, iti, thus, atat, godless, 
Utsvisrikshavaha. Utsvisrikshavaha. Those who desire to avoid. Visrija. Giving it up completely. Dorapmyam. Perplexities. Ananya. Absolutely. Soridaha. Actually, it's Soridaha. In goodwill. Rida upaguya. Taking them into the heart. Arta. Which alone are worshipable. Padam. Lotus feet. Pade, pade, at every moment. So I banged my head yesterday, and now the flies are after it. Because Prabhupada said the flies are always after the sores. And the bees are always after the honey. So devotees are like bees, because they're always after the honey. Of the nectar of Krishna Kata. And... Materialistic persons are like flies who are trying to relish the stool and what, etc. of the material world. Okay, so here's a translation. The transcendentalists desire to avoid everything godless, for they know that supreme situation in which everything is related with the Supreme Lord Vishnu. Therefore, a pure devotee who is in absolute harmony with the Lord does not create perplexities, but worships the lotus feet of the Lord at every moment, taking them into his heart. Jai Panchatatya. Hmm. Therefore, a pure devotee who is in absolute harmony with the Lord does not create perplexities but worships the lotus feet of the Lord at every moment, taking them into his heart. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. This is interesting. It's... Let's see what Prabhupada says. Purport. In the Bhagavad Gita, Madhama, my abode, is mentioned several times. And according to the version of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, there exists the unlimited spiritual sky, wherein the planets are called by kuntas or the abode of the personality of Godhead. And that sky, which is far, far beyond the material sky and its, and its sevenfold coverings, there is no need of the sun or the moon, nor is there necessity of electricity for illumination because the planets are self-illuminating and more brilliant than the material suns. But you don't get burnt. Figure that out. It's brighter than the sun, but it's not hot. Hmm. Pure devotees of the Lord are absolutely in harmony with the personality of Godhead. Or in other words, they always think of the Lord as their only dependable friend and well-wisher. They do not care for any mundane creature up to the status of Brahma, the Lord of the universe. <clears throat> Only they can definitely have a clear vision of the Vaikuntha planets. Such pure devotees, being perfectly directed by the Supreme Lord, do not create any artificial perplexity in the matter of transcendental understanding by wasting time in discussing what is Brahman and what is non-Brahman or Maya, nor do they falsely think of themselves as one with the Lord or argue that there is no existence of the Lord separately or that there is no God at all or that living beings are themselves God or that when God incarnates himself, he assumes a material body. In other words, Prabhupada's saying they don't they don't speculate. Nor do they concern themselves with many obscure 
speculative theories which are in actuality so many stumbling blocks on the path of transcendental, under, transcendental understanding. In other words, what Prabhupada's saying is that the material world is created in such a way that there are, un, there are unlimited ways to forget Krishna. And there's so many ways that everyone will find something attractive, some attractive way to forget Krishna. But here, here Prabhupada's saying, um, philosophically, you could find varieties of ways to forget Krishna. And one may wonder, if Krishna wants us to go back to Godhead, why are there so many creations of various philosophies that man has concocted if they're going to deviate us from Krishna consciousness? Why would Krishna allow that? And there's two answers. One is because, well, the main answer is because he allows it. That's the answer. Why would Krishna allows it? allow it? Because he allows it. Krishna allows us to do whatever we want. And in, in an interesting sense, the, um, the various philosophies that exist are various ways, various materialistic philosophies or monistic philosophies are ways of allowing the living entity to think they've come to some kind of understanding of truth while they're completely avoiding Krishna. So it's like, like if you think you're right, if you think you're wrong, at least you'll try to look to find out if you're right. If you think you're right, why would you look to, look to find out if you're right? You already think you're right. So you come across some philosophy, think, yeah, this philosophy is right. There's no God, or I'm God, or um, whatever it is you think. Matter is everything. And, and you see that people become so convinced of this, and Krishna gives them that conviction because they want it. And they can't understand anything else. So it's a perfect way to forget Krishna. And they don't understand that, that they're actually trying to forget Krishna, and so Krishna's providing some philosophy to forget him. And um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur has said that although there are many gurus in this world who are bogus, they are required. Bogus gurus are necessary. And you might think, why? Why do we need bogus gurus? You need bogus gurus for bogus people because bogus people need bogus gurus. They, bogus people need a way to forget Krishna and think that they're, they're on a spiritual path. Okay, well, here's a guru. He'll misguide you and you'll think that's true. But because you want to be misguided, you need someone to misguide you, right? So, so bogus gurus are required to misguide the people who want to be misguided. And we know from our own experience that if one is sincere, see, see where the fly landed? Right on the sword. That proves what Prabhupada said is true. Flies like sores. Um, did it again. Um, so whatever we want will be provided. Oh, I found my guru. He's amazing. He told us all he's God and he, he's got all this mystic power and you know, my whole life has changed. You know. um, okay, that's what you want. You want to believe that? So Krishna sent that to you. You know, we might think, well, that doesn't seem right. Why would Krishna do that? But Krishna is just giving us what we want. That's what we want. Prabhupada used to say, you want to be cheated? There, there are plenty of people out there lined up, ready to cheat you. Hmm, okay. It gets more heavy as the purport continues. Apart from the class of impersonalists or non-devotees, 
there are also classes who pose themselves as devotees of the Lord, but, but at heart maintain the idea of salvation by becoming one with the impersonal Brahman. They wrongly manufacture their own way of devotional service by open debauchery and mislead others who are simpletons or debauchees like themselves. In other words, let's say, you know, you think like spiritual life is just freedom, you know, unrestricted freedom, smoke, marijuana, have girlfriends, whatever. Then you meet some guru who says, yes, you must fully express yourself. You must fully enjoy without restriction. And this way, eventually you'll become renounced. You'll think, yes. So you'll resonate with that. You'll resonate with that person because you're like them. And that's what you want to hear that. So you'll find a guru who resonates. Now, you, you, who you resonate with. And if you've realized that or you've understood that doesn't work, when you meet a girl that way, immediately you'll think, this guy is bogus. Right? So those gurus are good for the people who want such gurus. That's what Prabhupada's saying here. I'll read that again. They wrongly manufacture their own way of devotional service by open debauchery and mislead others who are simpletons or debauchees like themselves. You know what debauchee means? It's a French word. It means like degraded. Debauchee, just like a bum. <laughs> Low class. That word's used in the Shishastakam, or that's the translation. I say Shiva, you know, you can, you know, like a debauchee, it's like you're married and your husband's running around with other women, and like that's a debauchee. You want to look it up? Want to read the translation for us? Debauche. I think it's French. It's debauche. It's not a word we normally use. Or Prabhupada uses it. All these non-devotees and debauchees are, according to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Duratmas or crooked souls in the dress of Mahatmas or great souls. Such non-devotees and debauchees are completely excluded from the list of transcendentalists by the presentation of this particular verse by Sukadeva Goswami. Hmm. In other words, we have this phenomenon that someone is dressed like a devotee, but they don't act like a devotee. So for us in ISKCON in the early days, we didn't really see that. It was either you were a devotee or you weren't a devotee. You either made it or you didn't make it. And if you didn't make it, you just generally left ISKCON. So we did, there was, it was pretty black and white. But then we went to India and we saw all these people dressed as devotees and tilak and so on. But they weren't acting like devotees. So it was our first experience of what Prabhupada's saying here, that someone may be dressed like a devotee and going around Hari Bol, Hari Bol, but their private life is a mess. So we understand that now, we have more experience, we've seen it, and we've seen that's possible. And um, we've even seen that there are some pradayas that promote that kind of thing as part of bhakti. Um, there was actually one guru, not, a Vaish, not, not in our line, but his idea was, in, unless you enjoy yourself, you won't be able to renounce. So he encouraged free mingling of men and women and so many things. So, and um, also posing as a sadhu. So we're so fortunate that Prabhupada came and established the standard. So we'll read the rest of the purport. It's a different topic now. So the Vaikuntha planets are factually the supreme residential planets called the Parampadam. The impersonal Brahma Jyoti is also called Parampadam 
to it due to its being the rays of the Vaikuntha planets. As the sun rays are the rays of the sun. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly said that the impersonal Brahma Jyoti rests on the person of the Lord. And because everything rests on the Brahma Jyoti directly and indirectly, everything is generated from the Lord. Everything rests on him, and after annihilation, everything is merged in him only. Therefore, nothing is independent of him. A pure devotee of the Lord no longer wastes valuable time in discriminating the Brahman from non-Brahman because he knows perfectly well that the Lord is para-Brahman by his Brahman energy. Hmm. Pure devotee of the Lord no longer wastes valuable time in discriminating the Brahman from non-Brahman because he knows perfectly well the Lord is Parabrahman by his Brahman energy, is interwoven in everything, and thus everything is looked upon by a devotee as a property of the Lord. In other words, a devotee, he, he sees everything as Krishna's energy, so there's nothing disconnected from Krishna, so he sees everything as spiritual. A non-devotee tries to disconnect things and see things in relation relation to how they can enjoy them. So here we have, we have this nice stand. We have a nice phone on it. We have a nice microphone. I could use this and I could promote myself as a great teacher and so forth. Or I can use this and I can see this mic stand, this um, camera stand is for Krishna. It's his energy. This phone is his energy, it's for him. This mic is for his energy, it's for him. And therefore, even though this is just a phone and a camera stand, I still see Krishna. It's his energy. So I, I, a devotee cannot not see Krishna. It's impossible. Well, a pure devotee. For a pure devotee, it's impossible not to see Krishna. They can't see anything other than Krishna's energy because they're not trying to enjoy it. And when you're trying to enjoy it, you see it separate from Krishna. Because if you're trying to enjoy it and you see it as Krishna, you can't enjoy it. You have to use it for him. Does that make sense? Like, I go to your house and, and I see something I like and I think, uh, she doesn't need it. She has so many of these. I'll just take it. It's mine. So if I see it as mine, it's no longer in relation to you. Right? But if I see it in relation to you, I can't take it. And if I use it, I have to ask you or I have to use it for you. Right? So we see everything in this world as Krishna's that has to be used for him. So, you, so a devotee can't not, not see Krishna. And a non-devotee sees everything as potentially useful for them. Just like um, what's become so um, prominent in the world today are teachers that help people achieve what they want to achieve. What do you want to achieve? I can help you. Right? So you have to visualize it, you have to be intentional. You have to be focused, you have to write down your goals, etc., etc. So I'm helping you achieve what you want, but I'm not helping you spiritually, right? So what do you want? I want to do this, or I want, I want, to, be, I want to be a rich businessman. That's mostly what people want, is they want a lot of money, they want a lot of success, and they want a lot of sense gratification. But if you have a lot of money, you can buy a lot of sense gratification. So why, why would anybody need a lot of money? Because they want a lot of sense gratification. Okay, so we're, we're going to do our seminar and we're going to show you how you can get filthy rich. Right. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the underlying premise, unstated, is life is meant for you to enjoy and get what you want. And that's what God wants you to do. So somehow God's in the picture, but he's not in the picture. Because as soon as you say this is what God wants you to do, 
then you can lock them in the closet. You don't need them anymore. You've been authorized. And then you just go for God's energy. And you enjoy it, and you think that's what God wants you to do. But you don't really see him there. You only see him in terms of um, how it's, or how he is so-called serving your sense gratification. Yes? Praise the Lord. Just got a new job. Got, um, making more money than my old job. Now I can get a better apartment. Praise the Lord. God loves me. No. You're going to remain entangled birth after birth. That's not the way God loves you. So, I am the center, and then everything in this world is meant for my enjoyment. That's the definition of material life. What Prabhupada's saying in the purport is the devotee is not in the center. He puts Krishna in the center, and he sees everything in relation to Krishna, so he can't, it's impossible for him not to see Krishna, even when he sees material things. This belongs to Krishna. This belongs to Krishna. This is for Krishna. This is his energy, and it belongs to him. And it's meant for his use. This is the bag for the microphone. This is Krishna's. It's not mine. Actually, it's not even mine. I borrowed it <laughs> from a devotee. He doesn't even know I have it, but it's okay. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, a devotee sees Krishna everywhere, and an atheist sees Krishna nowhere. Right? Everywhere we look, we see, oh, this is Krishna's flower, this is Krishna's tree, this is Krishna's creation. Look at these flowers, this is Krishna's artistry. Isn't Krishna a good artist? He makes all these nice flowers and nice colors. And, you know, he doesn't make flowers that have colors that don't match. And, you know? So that's how we see it. And the non-devotee thinks, oh, here's a nice flower. Let's smell it and enjoy it. sees Krishna nowhere. We see Krishna everywhere. Hmm. So this is what Prabhupada says. Uh, pure devotee, he sees Krishna is interwoven in everything, and thus everything is looked upon a devotee as the property of the Lord. The devotee tries to engage everything in his service and does not create perplexities by falsely lording, lording it over the creation of the Lord. He is so faithful that he engages himself, as well as everything else, in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. In everything the devotee sees, and in everything the devotee sees the Lord, and he sees everything in the Lord. The specific disturbance created by a duratma, or a crooked soul, is due to his maintaining that the transcendental form of the Lord is something material. So, when I was reading the verse, it said, a pure devotee who is in absolute harmony with the Lord does not create perplexities. And I was thinking, of course, there's a broader sense. Prabhupada is being very specific in a philosophical sense about creating philosophical perplexities, especially monism, seeing Krishna as impersonal, and how this is um, destructive for bhakti. And I was also thinking, in a, in a general sense, how sometimes we, cr we create perplexities by the way we think. Like, we often know that things, not we often know, we often experience that things in this world bother us, right? And sometimes the things that bother us really bother us, right? And they bother us so much that sometimes that's all we're thinking about and talking about. And then sometimes, it bothers us so much we want to do something to get back at the person who was bothering us. Yes? I just read something really nice yesterday. It said, a devotee is like sugar cane. You can cut him up, but he's always sweet. In fact, you cut him up and he's giving you juice. <laughs> so we should be like sugar cane. You can cut me, but I'll give you sweet juice. Well, the same example Prabhupada gives you. Tolerant like a tree, <clears throat> you chop the tree down, but it's not going to say, okay, fruit's for me, I'm not giving, I don't like you, you chop me down. 
still gives you shade, still gives you fruit. That's the nature of the tree. So, I have seen how often we, or how, I don't want to say how, how often, but at least how easily we can forget Krishna by allowing the things that are disturbing to perplex us. And so the word is used here, perplexities. I think it's doratnya. That means perplexity. So what does it mean to perplex? Perplex means to be confused. And this thing's bothering me. I'm thinking about it. I'm confused about it. I don't know how I should respond, what I should do. In some cases, the answer is, don't think about it, because it doesn't matter. Now, I think it matters. It's really important. And then sometimes something's so important, it matters so much to me, but the result is, it doesn't make me Krishna conscious. It actually takes away my Krishna consciousness. So if something is taking away my Krishna consciousness, how important could it be? But sometimes we know it's really important. We have to talk about this. We have to do something. This is wrong. I was mistreated. Okay, maybe you were mistreated. I don't want to sound like I don't care or unsympathetic. But my point is that sometimes it doesn't matter because it's just, it just becomes a vehicle to forget Krishna and a trick of Maya. Okay, Maya says, here's something to deviate you from thinking of Krishna. Here's a good one. This person just said something that really bothered you. Okay, let's deviate you from thinking of Krishna. Let's kind of churn this. That was really bad. They shouldn't have done that. They have been a devotee for so long. How could they say that? What kind of devotee are they? On and on and on. And your mind's going through this process. So now you're perfectly 100% engaged in not thinking of Krishna. And thinking about how bad this devotee is. Wow, what a nice trick of mine. And then as we've discussed before, sometimes the trick, it gets so good that you think about it during japa. You think about it during Bhagavatam class. You think about it during prasadam. You think about it during seva. And the whole day, you can not only forget Krishna, but you're engaged in this process of, of either offending a devotee, if not offending, and being extremely negative, which is a kind of offense. So, I would call that a perplexity. We're, a Maya, we're allowing Maya to perplex us about a material situation in such a way where we don't have a Krishna conscious solution, so the solution is that we just meditate on how bad we feel and how bad the situation is, and we perfectly forget Krishna, 100%. 16 rounds, didn't think of Krishna at all. All I thought about was this problem. Have you ever done that? 16 rounds focused on a problem? Samadhi, yeah. Maya is amazing. I can hardly think of Krishna and I'm chanting his name, but I can think of this problem. Samadhi means your mind is fixed. You're only thinking of one thing. So we all have experience of samadhi. Somebody upsets you, you get angry, that's samadhi. Samadhi anger. Yes? You have that experience? Fixed. 100% anger, frustration, or something. And Krishna's waiting for us, and all his instructions are waiting for us, and all his leelas are waiting for us, and then we're thinking of something negative, and we can't budge our mind. So this is very, very common. We see it happening all the time, and we're allowing ourselves to get perplexed. Sometimes devotees will write me and they'll say, well, this is the situation, what should I do? And I give them an answer they probably didn't want to hear, which is just forget about it. Because it's actually the best answer. Why? You can't do anything about it. And if you don't forget about it, it's going to kill you. But I can't just let this happen. Can you do anything about it? No. So why can't you just let it happen? If you try to do something about it, it's still going to happen anyway. So why waste energy on trying to correct it when you can't? It doesn't make sense, but we're attached. Right. 
because we want to control or we want to get back or we want to get even or something. Okay, that's fine. You can do that, but it comes with a price. You, you, it will drain your Krishna consciousness. And that's why oftentimes when there's a problem that can't really be resolved by anyone or anything, I will, I will suggest uh, to devotees, when they say, what should I do about it? I say, nothing. Why should I do nothing? Because you can't do anything anyway. You can try. Probably by trying, you'll have two results. One, you'll waste time. And number two, it'll get worse. Because the person who agitated you will get agitated when you try to get back at them. Right? Now, I'm not saying every situation is like this, but I'm saying there are many situations like this in which we cannot control anything and we're very upset and we're trying to control it. And uh, we have to see it as just a... You know, Maya, Maya's job is to help you, to help me, to help all of us forget Krishna. That's her job. That's what her appointed service is. Your service is to cause these people to forget me. So whenever we're caught in a situation where we're forgetting Krishna, whatever the cause is, no matter how reasonable it may seem, we should think, this is Maya. This is Maya's influence on me, and I'm allowing her to influence me in this way. So maybe I'm really upset. I can't chant my rounds. Huh, Maya's doing a really good job. And what is she telling you? You don't like this person. You should get back at them. Right? It wasn't fair. You can't allow this to go on. This is wrong. This person is going to hurt other devotees. Now, in some cases, it is wrong and we should do something. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But in some cases, we can't do anything. It's out of our hands. It's out of our control. So in cases like that, to meditate on it, then we should think, well, this is, this is Maya. She's alluring me. I think we were talking a few weeks ago when we were here, when we were doing our program in Morse. How do you spell it? Morse? Morse. And Cologne and Colocodon. We were talking, I think we were talking, maybe, we were, maybe it was somewhere else, about Maya baiting us. What were we talking about, Maya baiting us? So Maya throws a bait, like the carrot, Okay, here's a carrot. This person just said something about you behind your back. Here's a carrot. What are you going to do? You're going to think about it, talk about it, get upset about it, talk bad about them, get back. What are you going to do? There's a bait. Or are you going to just look at the carrot and go and say, I don't eat carrots, and just drop it. So Maya is always putting the carrot, isn't it? Many carrots, you know. There's so many carrots. But I think we should be aware of the carrots when they are carrots. And something is a carrot, Maya is putting the bait, and we should think, if I try to get this carrot, what's going to happen? What's the result? If the result is I'm going to forget Krishna, then what's the point? And we should be aware of the baits. And we all know we have so many things that taste good for us. So many nice, juicy baits, right? You know what your baits are, don't you? You know your favorite bait? So you know what your bait is, and Maya will come and go, here, just smell it, it smells good. You want to take a little bite? I think you'll like this. Have you had that experience? Yes. This is your favorite bait. I just made it for you. Here, I want to take it. Like some, some of us are like, we're like, we can't tolerate when things go wrong. So that's our bait. Oh, he did something wrong. Why don't you go tell him? Bait, you know. Go chastise him. It's not your position, but do it anyway, because he deserves it. <laughs> Here's your bait, right? If you like the bait, if your bait is devotees doing something wrong, well, you're being baited all the time because we're not perfect. You know, yesterday I mentioned, I said not every, everyone who's a good devotee makes a good husband or wife. That's our experience. 
right? But the reason is because we're not pure. If we were pure, we would make good husbands and wives because we, if you have fully manifest the qualities of a devotee, you, you'll be expert at whatever you do. So you'll be expert at being a husband or a wife or a father or a mother. Even if you don't want to be, if it's, that's your duty, you'll do it expertly. But because we're not pure, we're conditioned, even good devotees in the relative sense of like good, what we consider good within our movement, even the good devotees may not make good spouses. And we would assume they would. Because we're not yet completely pure or completely, completely detached enough to do just anything, anytime. So, if your bait is finding fault with devotee, wow, you're going to have a lot to eat because we're not perfect. And you'll have baits like all the time. And if you learn not to go with those baits, well, your life's going to be so much better. It's going to be so much easier. And if you go with those baits, you're going to have a really hard life because they're, they're all, the baits are all around you. And if you take those baits, you could forget Krishna for lifetimes, for eternity, if you take those baits. You agree? Yes? Yeah. Agree or not, it's true. Yeah. So as long as... as so uh, the point Prabhupada's making here in a, in a broader sense, without the specifics of referring to monism, is that there's so many ways to forget Krishna. And Maya will present you so many ways. It could be philosophical. It could be fault-finding. It could be, oh, here's a little carrot, position. Do you like to be in control? Okay, here's a position. You can be in control. And you misuse it, and you may offend devotees with it, with that control. You like, you like to dwell on problems. You love to talk about problems. You know, some people... They love to talk about problems. Do you know that? Have you seen it? You know. They love to talk about problems. So Maya will say, oh, here, here's a problem. Here's. Maya will present, you'll just go online to do your email and all of a sudden, somehow or other, a page will come up. Iskand gurus are bogus. And you're like, ah, oh, yeah, let me read this. You know? you'll, like, you'll like attract things like that. And you'll attract some Oh, and there's a big problem in ISKCON. You know, it's not a problem. Someone made it up and you know, posted an article, fake news, and you're like, wow, look at this. This is so bad with our movement. How can, you know, and you're telling everybody about it, talking to your friends about it. So some of us are like that. We like to talk about problems. Another bait. Talk about problems all day. You know. Forget Krishna. What did you do today, Prabhu? Ah, uh, nothing. What? I was talking about problems. <laughs> took, <coughs> took my, it took all of my time. So yes, so... Um, be, it, it's good to be aware of what your bait is and how Maya may bait you. And good to be aware that whatever your bait is, that specifically is something you want to be careful about it and try to avoid as far as possible. Yes? You know what your bait is? We may have many baits. Right? Anyway, I think, I think the more you think about your bait, the more you'll understand it and the more you'll see how it deviates you. The, you know, the whole material world is just one big deviation. And Krishna provides, like there's so many, you know, in the material world, there's so many things to deviate us. I mean, just go on Facebook. Like, you know, you get deviated by a little cat scratching something, right? Look at that cute cat. Look what he's doing. And watching a video. Oh, that's so cute. All right, you know. So for that three minutes you watched the video, that was like, Three minutes, you forgot Krishna. It's a good thing you didn't die at that time because you might have become a cat in your next life. But <laughs> Facebook was created by Maya. <laughs> uh, 
Well, you could say it was created by Yoga Maya to make us Krishna conscious. And also, Maya, she said, well, I'll join in and I'll provide all the facility to forget Krishna. So, yeah. There's just like so many, isn't it? Aren't there so many amazing ways to forget Krishna? Like you really like something. Like you really like something. And now it's 2018 and, you know, there's new technology, how to do things, and it's better. And, you know, when I was a kid, we had to do it this way. Now we can do it this way. It seems like everything's getting better, doesn't it? And, you know, you can enjoy things more. Like when I was a kid, I just had a, like a, 10-speed bicycle, but now you can have 22 speeds and the wheels come off and the whole bike weighs like one kg and, you know, and it's got shock absorbers, like, this is really good. And, you know, it's like, isn't it true? There are like so many things you could just get absorbed in and enjoy, so-called. Yeah, it's like, you know, when society wasn't so technologically advanced or industrialized, it wasn't that much, but now there's like so many things you can do. Yes? Just think, how do people live before there were movies? What did they do? How did they live before phones? What did they do? Different life, right? Less deviation. Yes? So, you have any questions or comments? Yes? Uh, you were speaking yeah. about Bobo's gurus and Bobo's people who follow them and who... Um, who need, who need a bogus... Themselves. So, how do we make the final check that we are not... <laughs> bogus ourselves. <laughs> That's a good question. The question is... Um, how do we know? So that how do we know we're genuine and are so that we don't get cheated? Yeah, it's a very good and question. The process is genuine. Okay, when the people in the same books are telling you about these books that they are real, it's like self proof. But how? So when the other people, other books speak about us the way we speak about us. <laughs> Maybe we're bogus. Uh, well, I, I think one thing is just objectively and intuitively we can understand that spiritual, spiritual advancement means detachment from sense gratification. And I think historically that is verifiable through every religious tradition. That simplicity and austerity, renunciation, that's all part of the spiritual path whether it's Christian or Islam or any path. Right? I think that's acceptable. So, first, if, if you're seeking out a guru and the guru has got three girlfriends and smokes pot all day, probably something's not right. So I think there's some basic level of common sense morality, right? And it's important for a person seeking a guru to know what spiritual life is because if he or she doesn't know, then when they're getting instructed by that guru, they may think they're making spiritual advancement, but they're just maybe have, maybe there's a good psychological effect and they feel better and they think this person is my guru, but actually they, they're still just as materially attached as they were before, but maybe they're in a a healthier emotional state, so they, so they feel happier, so they can enjoy the world better. So they have to know that that's not the goal of spiritual life. So Prabhupada said, therefore we have our books, and in our books it explains what is spiritual life, and, and it explains what a guru is. So a guru is supposed to represent the Shastra, the scripture. So that's one way you know who a bona fide guru is, because you, you've already read what, what's in the scripture. So, you know Bhagavad Gita, you know Bhagavatam. So if you go out in the world and you listen to different gurus, you'll immediately know who is bona fide and who isn't because who is representing the Siddhanta. Even if it's a Christian, by studying Gita, we understand, we basically understand the Bible. And if someone is preaching something bogus about the Bible, we'll understand. Like, like many of the, the preachers of the Bible, not so much in the Catholic religion, but in, in more modern versions of Christianity, 
They teach things like God wants you to enjoy. He wants you to enjoy sexually, financially, in so many ways. And so we as devotees, when we hear that, we think, no, this is backwards. This is completely bogus. If God loves you, you should have a lot of money. So we say, God may love you, and he may take everything away because he loves you. So because we understand the philosophy, then we understand, oh, this, this person is not representing the truth of their religion or any religion because they're speaking, they're speaking materialistic philosophy, philosophy of sense gratification in the name of this is what God wants or in the name of love of God. So if you have some basic knowledge of religion and spirituality, that's a criteria for understanding at least that the guru is representing a bona fide tradition. And then you have his example, how does he live? What's his level of renunciation? What's his level of dedication? Does he follow what he teaches? So, you know, Prabhupada never said, you know, this is the only way, the only tradition. But he did say that every, in every tradition, the basics are the same. You know, sense control, dedication, and so austerity. But a more specific answer for you and, and for us in general is the primary qualification of a disciple is to be sincere about developing pure devotional service. Because, because if you're sincere, nobody can cheat you. You wouldn't allow it because you want the pure thing. And if somebody's not giving you something pure, you wouldn't take that person as a guru. You want Krishna consciousness, you want the real thing, and you want someone to give it to you, right? Yes? So because of your sincerity, then Krishna will send you a guru who can give you the real thing and who lives the real thing, because that's what you want. And Prabhupada said so many times, and if that's not what you want, if you want something else, he'll send you a guru who will give you something else. Right? Sometimes you see a woman, she wants to get married, she can't find a man. And she finds a man who's not really qualified. But she likes him. But, but there's so many bad things about him, but she gets desperate. She really needs to get married. And so sometimes she marries the wrong man and it doesn't work out. So being a disciple is a little bit like that. Yeah, sometimes a, a disciple may be desperate to get a guru and maybe, maybe not discriminating enough. So, you know, it's a sober thing. Maybe it's not the best example, but um, I would say to the woman, you know, be, qualify yourself as, as a good woman, as a potentially a good wife and understand what are the characteristics of a good husband, and then make your decision on that basis, not, not just because it's a need and you need to fulfill it now. And I'm supposed to have a guru, so you know, I'm just going to get one. Sincerity is the most important thing for everything in, in devotional service, because sincerity is your greatest asset because it, it's, it's like it always guides you. Like, is this right or wrong? Well, if I'm sincere in my attempt to achieve pure devotional service, my sincerity will always give me the intelligence to determine right from wrong. So it's our greatest asset. And it will always give us the strength to persevere. Sometimes the successful people, they say, it, it's not it's not your focus on your goals that will make you successful. It's more your ability to continue after you've been knocked down again and again. So the sincerity, like we're going to get knocked down all the time by Maya, especially in the beginning. That's just more conditioned souls. We get knocked down all the time. We have problems all the time. We have doubts. We may have doubts. We may have weaknesses sensually or emotionally. We may not understand something, 
But that sincerity, it always keeps us going. It always, you know, it's like, okay, I got knocked down, but I want to be Krishna conscious, so it gets me up again and it puts me on the path. And it always, it'll always help me make the right decisions. So that's very important. Yes? <laughs> I can tell you one thousand times, okay, no, I just forget about it, but yeah. from here it comes up and again and again, and now yeah. I found a way to just take time, feel this, what comes up, just be placed with this feeling also, and after some time, I always experience, wow, I got through, and and then I feel Krishna and how he, um, yeah, everything is okay. Let it, Let it go. And for example, I met a woman, she lost her whole family during an uh, accident. And she, she was telling us how she could really get... Let, Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> and she says she had to go through, through all this pain. And then yeah. she cried for months. And she doesn't yeah. say just, oh, I cannot do anything about it. I just mm -hmm. don't think about it. Yeah. She really went deep, and, and and then after some months, she was uh, she she was healed somehow. Yes. Um, I'm just going to repeat it for them. Um, she's saying that letting it go, like I just said, let it go, and then just chant your japa, and that seems like a it's a gradual process you have to work through. And the answer is yes, and the answer is but it depends on the person, and it depends on the severity of the damage. Um, you know, if you've lost a loved one, yeah, that's a process, for sure. But if it's just like a normal interaction where someone did something that, was, that disturbed you, then as we progress in devotional service, we can learn to let those things go very quickly. It's a kind of a, an emotional detachment. Okay, can I let this go? Like, okay, I'm attached to eating something, so I'm going to eat less. That's like a physical thing I'm letting go of. Can I let go of an, an emotion that's harmful? Okay, this, this food is not healthy, but this emotion is not healthy. Can I learn to let go? And we can actually learn to let go. Hare Krishna. Um, that's something we can practice and learn. But it requires some detachment. And, and also, if you realize that this thing that I'm holding on to is destroying my devotional service, that becomes a very, a, quite a strong impetus to let it go. Not always easy to let it go, for sure. The bigger things, yeah, they may require you know, processes and healing and so forth. But you'd be surprised if you practice you'll develop a, a greater sense of emotional detachment. And I think it's important because these things are so common that things happen and they're disturbing. It's just the way life is. And if I'm getting disturbed by them, that's affecting my bhakti. So that's why Mahaprabhu said, Trinata Pisunichena. Be humble like a blade of grass. Learn to accept things. Because it, but Mahaprabhu is saying, if we can accept things like a blade of grass doesn't complain or a tree doesn't complain, then we can chant Hare Krishna because our mind is, is free. But if everything's bothering us all the time, then we get caught, we get like a magnet, we get drawn into that thing that's bothering us. It could be even a pain in the body. You know, I don't know if you've seen this, but some devotees are amazingly resilient during pain. But even though they're in pain, it doesn't affect them so much and others get very affected. And, and the same way with problems. Someone has a problem and it's somehow or other they don't get affected so much by it, someone else gets more affected by it. So if we're being very much affected by problems, it, it's, it's, it's detrimental to our spiritual life. So it would be really good to learn how to be more accepting, more tolerant. All right, this is just my karma. This person doesn't like me, but I should be respectful and kind of balance it out with 
Krishna conscious thoughts and attitudes and philosophy so that I could just, you know. So that's super important because these things are, I'm talking about the common things that happen all the time. You know, my mother just said this to me and I'm really upset. My brother did this, I'm really upset. Those kinds of things. Oh, the, the, the train is late now, I may not make my plane, I'm really upset. You know, it's like you, <laughs> you can't do anything. So it's, it's learning to be able to let go and say, well, this is what's happening, I have to accept it. And that's super important. And, and, you know, that's why I use the example of bait, but we could use the example of magnets. It's like, here's, what's your magnet? Like, okay, the train's late. Oh, that for me is like, if I'm gonna miss my plane or ride, I go crazy, I start getting angry, and so forth. So, we know our weaknesses. Yes? I think the problem is that this small situation, it triggers something deep in us, yes. oftentimes. Yes, yes, yes. Some, some experience from childhood, or yes. Could be. treated or something, and then what's, some small things come that trigger, yeah. and I think then it's also needed to go deeper. And, and yeah, if, um, that's true. Small things can trigger things which are deeper. And we may need to confront those deeper things. That's definitely true. But also, sometimes in being more Krishna conscious, um, it heals itself through detachment. Like, like it heals it. A lot of times, healing comes through detachment. Like, okay, maybe this thing bothers you or it's bothered you. But now you're more advanced, and somehow or other you see it's not that important anymore, or it's not that, why should I allow this to bother me? And you detach from it. So that happens. So they, both, they can happen on both levels. It depends on the person, and it depends on what the problem is. Um, people often ask me, they say, well, you know, if I have a problem, do I need to heal it through a, another process outside of Krishna consciousness? Through, through some kind of therapy or counseling or whatever. And my observation is, it depends on you and it depends on the problem. If that problem is very severe and it's still bothering you, you may need to deal with it directly. If, if you see that the problem's reducing as you're advancing, then maybe it's not necessary. Your advancement is sufficient because you're very Krishna conscious or maybe the problem isn't that deep. So I've seen both in the same person. So, um, but let's say, for example, we're talking about how we allow things to disturb us. So, so then, if I allow something to disturb me, and, and it's always similar things are disturbing me, then what you're saying is naturally I should look what's what's underlying this, you know, because anger. Come, anger is generated by something else. And anger becomes a byproduct. So maybe I let you down. So you become upset. And, but maybe you, you were let down by someone very close to you in the past. And, and all I did was say, I'll, you know, I'll be here at five, and I came at six because there was traffic, and now you're really angry. So then you look at that and say, why am I so angry? And then you realize, oh, it's because, you know, 10 years ago, this very close friend let me down and I, I can't stand to be let down. Anymore. So you could, by under, just by understanding, oh, and this is getting in the way of my relationship with devotees, just putting it in a logical sense, you could actually detach from it without having to go through a, a major process of healing. Like, I'll give you an example. In, some devotee did something that I felt was lack complete value and integrity, and I felt it was an offense to Prabhupada also, and totally betrayed me. So I developed resentment for him. And later on, in reflection, I realized that he was struggling, and a better response would have been just to try to help him through the situation. So when I realized that, then the resentment went away. I just realized my, it wasn't a Krishna conscious way to approach it. So I became more Krishna conscious, and then 
I was able to be a little more compassionate rather than angry. So sometimes the healing process comes by developing, you know, these qualities that I didn't have when I was younger. So it can come in many ways, but awareness of it is really important. And, and if you're aware, well, you're mad at me because I came late, because this person let you down, then you realize actually I didn't do anything really that drastically wrong. That's really important. Because, because if we don't realize that, then you won't like me. When actually you realize, well, the problem was me. It wasn't him. Which is usually the problem, isn't it? It's usually us. And so, th th this is a good point. So we, we could take the idea, there's also, instead of, like I'm saying, just let it go, there's also the idea of look in, look inside and see why what it is. I think we talked about that last night a little bit. Why, you know, why do I react this way, you know? When things are difficult, I react a certain way. Like maybe I distance myself or I, I just don't talk to the person or whatever it is. Why am I reacting this way? This is not a productive way to react. Is there a better way to react? Then I look and I see in myself that, well, I have this problem. You know, I can't, I can't bear to be offended, so I close up or whatever it is. And so these things are important for us because relationships are so important. And if these, you know, we might say, well, it's just a psychological problem. Why worry about it? And so in a sense, you could say that. But if it manifests in ways which are impeding your bhakti, then, then you, we, it's unfortunate. So we have to deal with it. And there was a devotee. It's a really nice story. This devotee, he didn't have good relationships. And he, he basically, he lived in the Brahmacharya Ashram, but he basically stayed away from everyone. He had like one friend. So he came to one of our forgiveness seminars and we did an exercise. And the exercise made him, he made him realize why he was like that. He didn't, he had no idea why he was like that. And he lived in a foster home and he was like really abused by the other boys in the foster home. So he kept away from everyone. He had like one friend. So when he moved in the ashram, he did the same thing. Of course, the ashram was different. They're not going to abuse him. And it was so amazing for him to realize that, oh, that's why I don't have relationships in the ashram. So, um, you know, you could preach to him, you know, you should be, you know, these are nice devotees, you should be, they love you, pratiganati, guyamaka, you know, these are the six, letters. you can preach like that, but it, it wouldn't work for him. So just to be aware, of the, the awareness of that basically solved the problem. Because once he was aware of it, it's just like, yeah, that makes no sense that I wouldn't be close to devotees. Now it makes sense why I wasn't. So that's my experience also. So what you say is very true. If, I, if, if something bothers me and then I can understand why, then I can, I can deal with it. And sometimes, at least my experience, like with this person, the problem is so illogical that it doesn't, you know, I say, oh, that's why. It's because I live in this foster home. Oh, this doesn't make any sense that I would act that way in the ashram. And it's just like, oh, then he was fine. It's just like it healed immediately once he understood. So that's the value of understanding what the cause of the problem is. Because you know? otherwise, you know, we just get upset. We don't know why. And it keeps happening all the time. And we're always going to blame the person. Because we don't know why. And because we don't know why, then it has to be the person's fault. Right? Couldn't be my fault, I'm perfect. But when you realize, no, this is, you know, I have a need for people to be trusting or tolerant or wherever because I have an experience where I wasn't trusted or some, or I couldn't trust somebody, then it all makes sense. Then you think, why should I punish this person because I was punished by that person? So sometimes healing can happen. In my, you know, for devotees, it, can ha it happens faster, in my experience. So our hearts are softer. And we have more of a motive to heal ourselves because we can see it's getting in the way of our Krishna consciousness. So that's a very strong motive. Isn't it? At least that's my experience. Like, in my forgiveness courses, the devotees forgive faster than non-devotees, generally. Their hearts are softer, and, and we know it's wrong. It's like, I'm a devotee. I shouldn't be holding on to grudges. So we move much faster because of our knowledge. Even though it's a, it may be an emotional problem, but our knowledge, it's, it makes it easier. Krishna says, Prabhupada says, well, Prabhupada said, Krishna says, it starts to shake us up. 
I shouldn't be doing this. So we move very fast. Isn't it? At least that's my experience. We have a question. I think we have a question. I'm going to go questions backwards. If we have our mind spinning around a problem, what can we do to stop it? Besides asking ourselves if I can change it. Just let it go. Let it go. Well, it's easy for me to say that because I'm a man. So I don't know what women do. I'm only giving the male solution. Let it go. And the men will go, yeah, just let it go. Yeah, we, men, we can do that, right? Just let it go. Just drop it. Yeah. But uh, easier said than done, right? But is there another solution to letting it go? You have a better solution? <laughs> Yeah. And we can't take shelter because we don't let it go. So, yeah. We don't let it go, so we can't take shelter. Yeah. You know, the, the, Buddhists, the Buddhists say if there's a bad thought, just let it go. You know, they practice that. They, it's, it's a practice of learning how to detach from thoughts and emotions. You know? I mean, I've studied a little bit, and they're What's interesting is that a lot of these other traditions have focused on certain practices that are in our tradition, but because we don't focus on them, we don't do them because we don't realize that's actually what we're supposed to do. Like emotional detachment, have you ever heard anybody talk about that? Letting it, you know, if you feel this, let it go. We don't normally talk like that so much. What do you do when you're angry? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Ram, just let it go. You know, that's, that's our process. So, Aditi, you just have to practice. But I always say, better than practice letting it go, practice that it doesn't come. Put yourself in a consciousness in a state where it doesn't happen, which is basically what we're talking about. Recognize what's causing the agitation and then work on that. So in the future, the agitation won't come. You'll be more accepting, you'll be more kind, you'll be more generous, less judgmental, and so forth. Then you won't become upset. Right? That's my philosophy. Better, you know, proactive than real. Okay, now I have the problem, I have to let it go. That's a lot harder, actually, than being in the right consciousness so you don't have the problem. That's always better. So, one more question. Once a local Bengali boy just corrected me when my feed bag was touching the ground and I was paying obeisances. I much appreciate it even now, else I would have continued to do so. Isn't it better at times if we correct others even if not in our position? <laughs> Should we correct others? We correct others, I don't know. That depends on the other. It depends on you. So an example, Casey, where a disturbance of one's mind is the fault of someone else. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Uh, if you think that way, how can you correct yourself? If, it, if how you think is someone else's fault, No, there is no example. It's not, our, it's not our philosophy. Even if it is someone's fault, at least we have to... Trinata, peace, and each We have to be tolerant. Okay, you're disturbing me because of what you're doing. Okay, and what you're doing is disturbing, and everybody agrees it's disturbing. All right? But ultimately, how disturbed I get is up to me. Right? Maybe sometimes we are too focused on our thoughts and feelings. And this is the problem. Yeah. You can be the problem. Like, you don't like to feel good, right? And if he makes you feel bad, you don't like him because you like to feel good. Whereas if you're a little 
more evolved spiritually, he may make you feel bad, but that's okay. It doesn't matter that you feel bad. You'll deal with it. And you'll work around it and you realize, well, you know, whatever, that's just who he is and I shouldn't feel bad. You'll work with it. So you're, you know, but some of us, it's like when we feel bad, it's like, oh, the universe is has falling apart. I feel bad, you know. Everyone has to save me. I have to feel good. And, you know. Isn't it? So yeah, that, that's, it's like our feelings become the ultimate, like, like there's nothing more important at this moment in time than my feelings. And my feelings are bad, have been hurt, so the universe has to stop and fix my feelings. Yeah, we can't live like that, right? Have you ever felt like that? Like the universe has to fix your feelings because you have bad feelings and like you can't exist with these bad feelings. It can be quite a selfish way to think. Yes? So we can stop. Is that okay? You have a question? No. Yeah. You're welcome. Hare Krishna to everyone. Um, what time is it now? Yeah, so in three hours we're going to give a, another class. We're going to do some stories on Bhagavatam. If you're around in three hours, we'll do a Facebook Live. Hare Bol. Shukra Ki Jai.